Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 18th and August webinar on igniting the ecosystem for education entrepreneurship in India. My name is Ashima, and I'm the membership services manager at the Asian Venture Philanthropy Network. ADPN is a unique funders network based in Singapore, committed to building a vibrant and high impact philanthropy and social investing community across Asia. We are very pleased to have two of our AVPN members speaking today. Representing our AVPN member, Desh Pandey Foundation, we have Naveen Jha, who will give us an overview of the work being done by the foundation and will share his vision of enabling local solutions through a bottom-up approach. We also have Deepak Menon from Village Capital, an AVPN member organization. Deepak will walk us through the Village Capital investment process which includes finding entrepreneurs through a rigorous sourcing and due diligence process, training them through a three workshop investment readiness program, and then finally investing into the top two from each program. Before we proceed, a few housekeeping instructions. We will not take any questions during the presentation, but will open the floor for Q&A after the presentation. Please feel free to use the console to type in your questions during the webinar. And I will raise the questions to our speakers after their presentation. If you have further questions that are not answered by the end of the webinar, you can mail us at membership at avpn.asia. Without further ado, I will give the presentation to Naveen. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Naveen, please go ahead. Sure, thank you. Uh, so my presentation is uh, focusing two part. One is that uh, uh, our our uh, education system and, and some of the learning from that we are building. And the second, how we can build the entrepreneurial ecosystem and especially focusing on the education entrepreneurship. Basically, what does mean and how it is different working in a a uh, smaller city in India, like like a third tier city kind of infrastructure. How you can build the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So first part, I'll, I'll take you through the the our skill development program. And uh, when we started uh, the skill development program five years back, back uh, we, in 2010, actually seven years back, we realized that uh, the the candidates are coming from the rural areas and district towns, where they uh, have a different exposure of life how we can prepare them or market ready for the uh, long long-term perspective so that's how we started the residential skill development program here which is four and five months long and usually basically we get up at six o'clock uh, do something 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 night ten o'clock so you you go through that rigorous process and of course you build your communication skill, IT skill, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Same time, you become a problem solver, and also realize that every day, oh, I'm doing better than yesterday. Every week, better than last week, and that's how the the, the candidates feel the change in them. So, I'm, I'm sure that's the whole purpose of the education. 
how the uh, students and the whoever is going to training, how they realize that they are week by week or day by day, how they are doing better and better. So that was the whole thought process, and we started the uh, uh, program. Next slide, please. Uh, so if, if you if you uh, uh, see the whole like experience learning part, we have kind of uh, uh, inculcated. This is our skill development center where uh, people get a different thought process or like open building concept. Uh, next slide. And and you can you can experience the whole energy. How uh, then so far we have a 70% placement rate. And and uh, uh, after getting exposure, almost 20% candidate decided they would like to further uh, continue the uh, higher education. So what does what does it mean that we, we are kind of working in an economy which is very stagnated kind of economy. And even then, because we develop the entrepreneurial mindset kind of uh, uh, people through daily working lifestyle. So that's where their chances of uh, getting job or they are setting up their own. I, I'll take the example that some of the uh, graduated have started their own and, and they are kind of thriving in this ecosystem. Next slide. So uh, basically these are the some of the example of uh, some of the stats where you can see that uh, the, the candidates who have graduated uh, they are, uh, their first time job and what if they compare with their peer, their salary has gone two, three times. And right now we are working with 300 plus partners who are kind of uh, coming and, and uh, recruiting there. And and uh, whatever the incubator, uh, we have also were graduate who want to set up uh, the 30 plus has kind of uh, got one or other recognition as award in entrepreneurship. Next slide. And, and these are the two examples uh, just giving you one of our graduate uh, initial graduates, Shavni. She was a Femina a woman, uh, business woman award. She she got it. And another uh, person who graduated, he developed the Borwell recharge technique. And he is recognized by the NABARD for the unique technology uh, to, to impacting the, the rural life. So a lot of these kind of uh, uh, new ideas, which is totally different addressing uh, uh, the the local needs, the entrepreneurship can be club in the uh, education process. Next slide. So uh, here I, I would like to take you a little back uh, uh, thought uh, process that like how this all social innovation ecosystem we started. So we we our we have our first center in MIT in uh, US and to, that's totally focusing on technology. Technological Innovation Center, we started in 2002. And the whole thought, next slide, whole thought process is that like a lot of research is going on, how these research go out from the university and create a, some market impact. And in that case, probably you're predominantly working on the innovation. And, and then you try to see that when you have a prototype or MVP to just see that uh, which market segment, et cetera, et cetera, you can do, which is the relevance. And if it is makes sense, then you will create a huge market impact. That's the how the, our technological innovation center work. But the moment when we started, next slide, the moment we uh, uh, started in, in, in India, the whole equations turn other way around. So what does it mean that um, when, when you start developing a social innovation, the deep understanding of the, of the problem is, is become the key factor uh, in developing the solution. It's not like innovation is the first time in the world and like a, is a patent where it has a patent and it cannot, uh, 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 it's a restricted in a lot of way to safeguard the uh, economic in, interest and other interests of the innovators. But here, yeah, relevance play a huge role. What does it mean that if suppose you develop any education product, etc., and 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 if you're developing those products with the community you would like to uh, develop like your essentially your customer, then there is chances that uh, the huge adaptability and the impact. Otherwise, you keep struggling with develop the good product, but why this is not accepted, often it is us. So that's what we realized that when we develop the social innovation uh, uh, kind of ecosystem, the relevance play a huge role. Next slide.
and and our uh, major learning is spread uh, on that like we we all talk about the solution etc but when we develop the ecosystem uh, is a huge amount of energy need to be spent that how we can build the capacity of the local stakeholder so uh, by creating uh, by co creating the solution otherwise uh, these uh, solution won't move too uh, too far if it is not co created with the community and in that process community participations either is a paper use model it give the first proof of concept that is something is working otherwise like a typical investor invest either impact investor other and we keep figuring out why it is not moving next level it move in it work in one uh, context but other uh, context so how you get those early feedback in the product that become a kind of uh, 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 big uh, proof of th those uh, uh, solutions and uh, we have also realized that there's nothing called silver bullet so we always try to find that leading the big idea and and we kind of believe that it will heavily impact the bottom of the economy uh, that that may not be the right way of thinking the more important which is earlier i mentioned that how we can build up the local community capacity because if you see it like in education system or health system in india i'm true it may be uh, uh, other developing country uh, there you need uh, those even if you design some app or some processes or some uh, way of impacting the education uh, we need that community have a capability to absorb those uh, solution so how we can create a first where you have a, a culture of problem solver in the community and that kind of in longer build the capability of absorbing these new ideas coming in the society otherwise a lot of time there is resistance and and i'll i'll show you in my end slides uh, uh, how that culture of problem solver is is play a very important role in in building the any uh, kind of ecosystem and that's where we believe that once you have problem solver you have a people who can absorb the uh, those ideas because if you see in any community you will have essentially three kind of people one is the people who see the problem and they get excited to solve it second is to see the problem they they are obvious, uh, uh, kind of they say they complain it and third is that there's a problem they don't care it but but any vibrant community is 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 the uh, indicator of which one is a, in higher if it is the first category people are higher you'll see the community is kind of vibrant but if you have more complaining and they are uh, oblivious to the problem those community get kind of deadlocked uh so how you can create it and and that's how this all technology platform policy access to capital etc etc layer can be built on top of thing so like for example we are we are working in hubli now we have more than 200 uh, uh, new startups are working and we have almost uh, four incubation centers one is ours and three four uh, others are working so whole ecosystem got developed and then there's a lot of uh, kind of sharing with each other and new ideas are getting appreciated so our, our major learning uh, was that first to build the culture of problem solver which looked little abstract that I'll, I'll show you how it can be done in education and then lot many ideas can be developed on top of the things next slide so right now we have uh, like four places smaller places we, we are trying in Hubli and Telangana and UP, where these uh, ideas ecosystems have have been developed. Next slide. And and these are the, like basically a four way to engage. Like we have enable work with we provide the grant, we incubate the entrepreneur, micro entrepreneur to the mid size and bigger, and also uh, how we can enable the local youth so they kind of skill and they can be part of it. then we have several innovation in agriculture uh, in malnutrition and and several other opportunity where an idea sharing play where these ideas can be shared and then things can be built up further next slide so these are the some some of the examples in health education agriculture livelihood 
people have been working like we have here uh, Akshay Patra, the world largest kitchen who provide the whole government school food in a very entrepreneurial way. Agastya, they work on the science education, how the hands-on learning science education can be done in the public education uh, field. Uh, basically, essentially, uh, uh, kind of promoting how the experiential learning people from uh, yes culture to why culture, uh, how you, you can have people asking questions and, and, and basically developing the curiosity among them to learn all the things, how, how they understand the surrounding and how learning patterns can be developed on the, uh, uh, their local environment. Um, next slide. Next slide. So the, these are some of the things uh, I, I would request organizers to just keep pressing. So how the, uh, in educate young people, how they are kind of developing the mindset of the problem solver. So I, young kids, uh, young uh, students are working to build a bridge or, or helping the uh, children to go to the school, um, low cost solar system or the solving the parking problems. So you see that the students are, are kind of uh, observant to what is the problem they are seeing the uh, surrounding and how they can uh, uh, instead of complain or how they can be the uh, change maker and they can solve those problems. And the more the, the more the people do it, the better uh, uh, problem solver and absorbent uh, uh, so ecosystem we can we can build it. That's what I was talking earlier before you build the ecosystem. How, how what are the things we need? Next slide. Uh, I would now like uh, to... So basically, essentially... Uh... Go ahead, Naveen. Go ahead, Ashim. So, so basically, in, uh, uh, concluding uh, this thing, um, I, I would like to share that when we are uh, working in a smaller town or, or rural setting kind of area, so how we develop the ecosystem and, and education, especially in, in context of education entrepreneurship, where like right now we have four places in the south and north uh, uh, that, that we develop, and we are seeing the similar kind of uh, uh, excitement at, at the grassroots level where these ideas can be piloted. And then several of the entrepreneurs are working and they understand that uh, how it is important to be closer to the the customer, whoever I was a public school or student, and experiment those ideas. Instead of you keep developing the innovation and then say, okay, let me check how it is working or not. That time is too late to develop your uh, product or services. So how from very beginning, how you can have a customer feedback in the processes integrated, and these kind of sandbox uh, uh, can play a, uh, a very, very strong platform to experiment new ideas, providing the feedback, uh, what is happening, and, and the customer touch kind of smoothen up a little bit of friction. Like, for example, if anyone start, it minimum to minimum it takes six months to kind of uh, even to try out with any customer. So these kind of platform can ease out that process and and uh, uh, can, can give them more better understanding of relevance. So these ecosystems play a huge role in, in developing the entrepreneurship. That, that's what we believe. Great. Thank you, Naveen. Uh, I'll now request Deepak to share his thoughts on the topic. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ashima. Um, hi, uh, everybody. I'm uh, Deepak Menon. I head uh, Village Capital in South Asia. Uh, I, um, I'm just uh, so Ashma, I have access to the slides, but it seems to be right at the beginning. So give me a minute to just go down. Yeah. So, um, so I'm going to share a little bit about the work that we do, specifically in the context that uh, we, as a globe, as a venture capital firm ourselves, have focused on a process of investment that in our opinion and in our experience uh, creates uh, very tangible benefits for investors and entrepreneurs alike and has yielded us a portfolio with some extremely diverse and innovative companies in some very hard sectors. So uh, 
uh, the focus of what I'm going to talk about is essentially what that process is and how we think it's valuable. Uh, it could be it's valuable to other investors like ourselves as well as uh, entrepreneurs, of course. So, um, so essentially, we work in five sectors: uh, agriculture, education, energy, financial inclusion, and health. And uh, our thesis around these sectors is fundamentally that entrepreneurs who are living these problems who are interacting with the communities that face hard problems in these sectors are best positioned to so solve some of these problems and by virtue of the challenges inherent in trying to ac address a problem in these sectors while also building a scalable business model around it uh, equity uh, investment in particular becomes a hard uh, play for a lot of these entrepreneurs and um, Investors often, therefore, tend to end up overlooking some of these startups, and some of it is a function of place. For example, in India, again, this may not be as applicable yet, but in the U.S., uh, more than 50% of investment goes to just uh, three states, and uh, in uh, and again, there are issues around uh, ethnicity, race, gender, which often prevent a lot of uh, entrepreneurs from accessing the networks and capital that they need to grow their business uh, successfully. Uh, and uh, what we really try to have tried to do through our process is to say that we recognize these blind spots. We recognize that as investors, we have these blind spots ourselves. And I'm sure there are some other blind spots that we haven't found yet that we have even with up within our process. But um, and therefore, as investors, how do we build something that allows us to make our investments while addressing some of these uh, challenges? What we do is we find entrepreneurs solving a real and pressing problem. We train them via an investment readiness curriculum. So our training is focused completely on investment readiness and scale. Our training uh, is focused on putting, enabling an entrepreneur to pitch their business in a manner that really conveys not just what they do, but where they want to get to and how they're going to get returns for an investor. And our investment, uh, so our training process becomes our uh, due diligence process when we interact with the entrepreneurs as part of our training process. And then our investment process, our investment committee becomes the cohort of entrepreneurs who we are working with for a particular training program. And I'll explain what a program looks like in just a minute. But essentially what we do then is that we, we do not follow the traditional top-down lending model of investors conducting due diligence and then investing into ventures. What we believe is that the entrepreneurs who are trying to build businesses in addressing these challenges, addressing various challenges in a sector, are best positioned to understand each other's journey and to really uh, comment on which of them is best positioned to scale. And um, therefore, what we do is ensure that uh, the entrepreneurs interact with each other and the entrepreneurs uh, uh, get uh, uh, the entrepreneurs interact with each other and the uh, entrepreneurs uh, Uh, Deepak? Uh, I think Deepak has got disconnected. So in the time that he comes back, uh, maybe we can take a question uh, in that much time. Uh, Naveen, there's a question for you, uh, which has been asked by Lisa, sure. uh, which is, uh, do the graduates of the center go on to tertiary education or do they straight go into building their own social enterprise? So, so as I said, uh, um, uh, 
around 20% of the education go for the next layer of education because the first time they got a whole experience of learning and self-learning, peer-to-peer learning, and uh, uh, kind of all, all these aspects. So 20% prefer to go to the next level of learning. Around 80% uh, 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 go for the job market to they realize that for them it is too important Hello. to get those uh, uh, skills. And then last 10% go for the uh, uh, setting up their own enterprises. I, I guess Deepak is Hello. back. Yes, Deepak is back. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I just lost connectivity completely. I don't know what happened. Everything so, just uh, I'm so sorry. This is asking sorry. Naveen a question, but uh, you can go ahead. Uh, Deepak, I'll move to the Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so, um, so I was, uh, I, I was, uh, I think the screen is, yeah, your screen is still at the slide I was at. So sorry about that, everybody. I'm not quite sure what happened. Uh, so um, what we really do is follow a process where entrepreneurs work together during the program, conduct due diligence on one another, and then amongst themselves, select the top two ventures who in their opinion have the highest likelihood to scale. And uh, we pre-commit capital to these two ventures. Uh, in India, typically about 50,000 uh, US dollars pre-committed uh, in equity, but uh, we could go as high as 100,000. And uh, globally in the US, we have also looked at structures like, uh, I mean, we lo look at more debt than equity for these sectors. And then we have also looked at structures like uh, uh, profit share. So in India for now, since the fund is uh, a United States fund, we are uh, uh, risk constrained in terms of only being able to do equity. but. Uh, so these are some of our results, and I can share more about uh, uh, you know our, how our results, our impact, etc., and also share some figures uh, separately with people if they're interested in that. But what I'd really like to do is use uh, the remaining time to quickly explain how the what we mean by this whole find, train, invest process, and what it actually involves. So uh, typically we work in a sector. So right now we are working with K-12 education entrepreneurs. And uh, we have just completed the find component. So we reach out to 300 plus ventures in a sector. We are up, we just completed this process for education K-12 and we are launching uh, in the first week of September for FinTech. Uh, so we are doing two programs this year with two cohorts, one in education, one in FinTech. Now, um, what we've done, what we do is re, uh, for reach out to ventures through online sources, through network, our network of people who work with us like investors, uh, sector leaders, uh, alumni, etc., and uh, through this initial outreach, we essentially vet uh, through a combination of uh, conversation of looking at information that's in the public domain, as well as wherever we think there there are applicants who are early stage because we work only with early stage entrepreneurs and who align with the problem statement. For example, in education, we had a database of about uh, 400 plus entrepreneurs, but then it came down to about 300 odd who actually worked in with a K-12 focus. So we vet in that manner and the vetting also includes conversations with those entrepreneurs who appear to be high quality. And uh, we typically get about 80 plus venture applications. Uh, we get about 130 for education K-12. Uh, our target is usually to get about 80. We go through a process of evaluation which involves in-depth due diligence interviews, spending time at their office offices and finally arrive at a cohort of 12 to 15 models uh, by virtue of the fact that the, there is peer selection involved these need to be diverse in terms of their uh, business models and uh, to some extent the audience uh, well the audience that they address of course is all in this case k-12 but for example we would not have two teacher teacher training tools in the same cohort we could have a teacher training tool, tool and an after school learning model and uh, we also uh, aim to find entrepreneurs from smaller towns. We aim to find companies with uh, female founders, co-founders, and uh, we spread out the diversity of the model, not just from the perspective of uh, entrepreneurs learning from each other uh, and uh, due diligence for each other, but then also as a fund, it allows us a much broader base for a diverse portfolio. In this process, we have a lot of participation from a network of investors to reach out to entrepreneurs, refer entrepreneurs to us, and also give us early feedback on ventures so we can decide who we take some for conversations forward with and who we don't. The curriculum itself involves three workshops, each four days long, typically in three different cities. So entrepreneurs can connect with a number of mentors in each city and take, uh, leverage uh, the local ecosystem. Workshop one essentially focuses on uh, 
what the how the entrepreneurs define their value proposition and how they define who their target customer is and whether what they're solving is actually a pain point. Workshop two essentially focuses on people. So it focuses on customer discovery, potential strategic partnerships, and also on uh, internal operations, human capital, et cetera. And workshop three ultimately brings all this together to help the entrepreneurs build out a pitch deck as well as a deal screen that they use at the end of workshop three to pitch to a group of about 20 to 30 early stage investors in the space who come in to meet them. Several of these investors may have mentored them during the previous workshops as well. These pitch sessions are structured as around meetings around uh, tables and not as uh, dias based quick pitch sessions. These are more meetings where the entrepreneurs share their pitches and get a lot of feedback. And um, uh, at the end of this whole process, the investors are free to invest in whoever they chose to, but we have a process where the entrepreneurs rank each other according to this framework. It's called Viral Venture Investment Readiness Action Levels, and uh, it is the core of our curriculum. Essentially, throughout the workshops, what the entrepreneurs do is work together to break, uh, work together uh, with, with each other as well as with on mentors to break down their, uh, their business in, across these eight dimensions and to really think about each of these dimensions in terms of where they are and where they want to get to, to uh, with against the backdrop of the questions, how do we, where do we want to get to to become a successful business? And then also, how do we get there such that we get a good return on investment for anybody who puts money into us? And that is the ultimate core of the ranking methodology as, as well. The uh, entrepreneurs rank each other on these eight uh, variables, uh, keeping in mind these two questions. And uh, there are a bunch of sub questions within each variable that help them uh, think through uh, how to evaluate uh, one of the other, uh, evaluate the other companies. The top two who emerge from this are the ones that we be investing to. And um, the broad trends that we, that draw, drive us to do this is one, we, we, we feel that investors uh, such as ourselves and others, we tend to look at problems that we're familiar with. And uh, if, when we go out and spend so much time sourcing uh, for entrepreneurs looking in the most unlikely places and asking other entrepreneurs to recommend entrepreneurs, we, we come face to face with a whole array of things that we probably never even knew existed or things that we didn't consider problems because they're not problems for us in our routine lives. And then the other thing that we're trying to break is to say that break the pattern of looking for entrepreneurs who come only through your uh, alumni networks, break the patterns of entrepreneurs who who, who who fit into the into what you think an ideal entrepreneur should be and instead get talk to a, a lot of different people get the entrepreneurs into the room and let them decide among themselves who uh, is the most likely candidate for investment we this model has worked well for us since 2009 globally and again i can share more figures around our results uh, for anybody who wants to but Fundamentally, we found that within the cohort, there have been strong collaborations. People have signed formal partnerships with each other. Investors enjoy the advisory meeting format because it allows them to get in quality time with entrepreneurs instead of sitting through a series of pitches from our dais. Uh, participation as mentors allows in, for example, there's a difference between an investor listening to a pitch versus one spending half an hour with an entrepreneur working only on their unit economics. Uh, or only on something like the human capital strategy, which otherwise may not even reflect in a final investor pitch, allows them a lot more understanding of the companies. And finally, the way we have broken down the model into those eight variables uh, often leads to companies pivoting. I think, I think one dissonance we often have uh, internally is, uh, as a fund, we when we select a cohort after that uh, extremely intense due diligence process, when we select a cohort of uh, 12 to 15 companies, we would like each of them at the end of the process to be a potential investment for us. Uh, whichever to float to the top, we would we would like that all of them are of uh, equity investable quality if, if in India. Having said that, the fact that our program really breaks down the model and gets entrepreneurs to step back and deep dive um, into different parts of their business often leads to pivots. And as a program, it is a matter of, uh, it's also a matter of pride and learning for us when someone decides to pivot completely to the point of changing their model or uh, shutting down for a while and stepping back because of the learning they've had from the program. Though this does result in us having one less company that could potentially be one of the top two. 
but as a program uh, with a certain kind of curriculum that kind of when an entrepreneur gets learning to that degree um, it's uh, we feel that we really help them think through some hard questions for themselves uh, so that's all i had to say and i'm happy to take any questions either now or later great uh, thank you deepak uh, we'll now move on to questions if anyone has questions please type them in the console and we will direct them to the speakers um, a question that I have uh, for Naveen and Deepak, please feel free to put in as well, um, is from Amea Bondre. Uh, Amea asks that there are very few entrepreneurial initiatives focusing on improving basic reading, math, and other skills for pre-primary and primary school children. Do you have any broad suggestions for individuals who want to venture or support ventures in this area? Also. Are there any particular work or teams within the Desh Pande Foundation who focus on this segment uh, of the market, which is young children? Yeah, basically, uh, if you see that uh, uh, most of the public schools, what were the reasons of uh, low performance is the writing ability. And a lot of survey like us, uh, the government's own survey has highlighted that the uh, limited capability of reading writing is, is a major issues so several of the programs like we have uh, agastya who focus on the science learning including math uh, at that level how they can get their hands-on experience then uh, uh, we supported another program we supported the uh, magic bus then uh, we have a mantra for che like seven eight different programs are focusing at the children level, primary school level how their reading writing ability can be enhanced. But having all said that everyone is working on a very uh, smaller scale because the public schools are distributed uh, uh, in rural areas and logistically it's, it's get tough. And uh, being education, the gestation period is longer. Had it been agriculture, health, etc., the impact is visible very quickly, but education take a very long uh, time uh, to see really some kind of a, a verifiable uh, uh, kind of output. Um, yeah. uh, if I may just chime in there, uh, our, uh, we just finished selecting our K-12 cohort and uh, there are three companies and uh, we always work with for-profit entrepreneurs. So there are three companies in that cohort who do focus on the segment that you ask about. I, uh, unfortunately we haven't, uh, we just, we've just in the process of announcing to them that they've been selected. So I can't share their names publicly yet until they, they, they know first and they confirm back to us. But um, we would have that process done by Monday or Tuesday. And then if anyone would like to be connected to those specific companies, I'm happy to make the introduction. Great. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for you, Deepak. Um, the question is that there is a strong focus on mentoring at initial stages of entrepreneurship education. What kind of systems and processes are being created to ensure that this mentoring is provided at a quality that will set these individuals up for success? Uh, right. So I can, um, I think at a broader level, I think a lot of accelerator programs, uh, and uh, when I say accelerator programs, I am uh, uh, distinguishing uh, accelerator programs from what we do because we investors and we also we specifically focus on investment readiness and scale. But I think a lot of uh, larger programs, uh, incubators and accelerators that are uh, looking at longer term support and are uh, really trying to build out uh, mentoring as a very strong component. So corporate uh, incubators where they have access to people from within the corporate for mentoring uh, partnerships across different types of organizations. So one example uh, uh, specifically within fintech, for example, is uh, uh, it comes easily to mind is India stack, which while they work on uh, uh, while their work does not directly involve mentoring startups, they do want uh, the, the tech expertise that they possess and the fact that what they work on is valuable to fintech startups to be um, uh, to be disseminated to that community. And so they come, they partner with a lot of incubators to do very strong mentoring. So broadly speaking, uh, I think there are a lot of programs which are trying to build in both on-site mentoring as well as longer term mentoring connections. And I think that is something that is being recognized as uh, important right through the uh, life cycle of an organization. Mentors often become advisory board members, etc. Within Village Capital, our mentoring is specifically at the uh, sessions during uh, 
the program and very tied very closely to the curriculum. However, we are experimenting with formats where we can provide office hours from mentors uh, and uh, these mentors very often for education specifically these mentors are very often not only investors but also large potential strategic partners uh, or even large potential customers where the startup is not yet at a stage where they bring that much value to this partner or customer but they will get there with a certain degree of mentoring and uh, early pilots with the customer partner and I, that brings me to my final point where i think specifically in education where it's hard to scale um, working with uh, mentors who can provide you access to pilots on the ground to either test your product or service as part of a larger pilot or to build a pilot for yourself. I think that is a very powerful way of uh, getting support that will uh, take you a long way. And I think uh, that is something that could ideally be built a lot more into a lot of support programs. Great. Uh, thank you, Deepak. The next uh, question is also uh, for you. Uh, there are two questions from Priyanka Dube. Uh, the first is, is there a set criteria for the startups that you work with, especially regarding age or citizenship? Uh, the next question from her is, how do startups get to know of your program? Given the widespread and nature of startups, what are the various modes of communication that you find effective in reaching out to the right people? Uh, right. Uh, so um, first question in terms of criteria, we look for early stage uh, and that is very broadly defined as someone who hasn't raised more than 1.5 million US dollars. We define this globally. So in India, this tends to include a lot of startups who in terms of where they are, where they are in their business or product journey would actually be more closer to mid stage. It includes startups who are looking at a pre series A or series A round. Uh, because of the high ceiling when you do the conversion. In the US, it tends to look, uh, the programs tend to have more startups who are looking for seed. So broadly, I'd say seed to pre-seed to series A is the spectrum of startups that are eligible for the cohort. Anybody who wants to raise within that spectrum. Um, the um, uh, in, There is no criteria in terms of age. Uh, what we really want, since this program is about investment readiness and scale, and uh, since we, we therefore believe that a lot of assumptions about scale, your assumptions about scale essentially need to be rooted in actual customer and market data, even if it is demo data or, you know, an early pilot or prototype. Therefore, we do not work with startups who are at the drawing board stage. You need to have ideally some customer feedback, some traction, even some early revenue, just prove whether there's willingness to pay even from a single customer. Uh, but um, uh, even in the absence of all this, at least a minimum viable prototype. So uh, that's and of course, we work only in the five sectors I've mentioned. So uh, that's uh, really what we look at as uh, criteria. Beyond that, we have a selection screening process where we really look at the same variables that I uh, uh, mentioned in the viral model. Essentially, we look for high quality startups with a strong model, a strong impact vision and uh, who do they seem to have potential to scale. And uh, uh, the and and we we look for startups. For example, in the K twelve cohort, we have uh, spoke uh, included. Uh, there are startups who are working specifically for K twelve education and uh, with children uh, for children with special needs. And uh, therefore, we try and look for sectors also sub sectors within the larger sector that seem to be undervalued in the investment space in general. So that's the criteria. Because on the other side, yeah, we well we use the same channels that everyone else does. We use social media. We use uh, you know, uh, play places like your, I mean, publications like your story and uh, Inc. 42. We try and go to meetups. Uh, our, the information about our programs is, of course, available on our website. But we do, we find all these channels fairly effective. We also partner with uh, people for the program. So K-12 Education, we our partner is um, Omidyar Network. And uh, for FinTech, our partners are PayPal, uh, uh, FMO, and BlackRock. So. Uh, this year we have we could have PayPal and BlackRock partners last year as well. So that gives uh, allows us to leverage a wide network within the community to spread the word. So. Great, thank you, Deepak. Uh, the next question is: uh, There are numerous programs that provide startup capital to support entrepreneurial activities, but in many instances, a lot of these initiatives fail to reach the scale that they might have earlier envisioned due to the inability to source additional financing. What suggestions or advice would you offer to such startups? Uh, 
uh, shall I take this question? Sure. So look, uh, one thing is, is pretty uh, clear uh, entrepreneurs should have it that they are not making enterprise for the venture funds. They are making enterprise for the impact or themselves or whoever the stakeholder. So uh, if the sustainability components are inbuilt, uh, uh, you may grow slow, you may you may grow uh, not in times, maybe in percentage, but you can grow it. And we have seen that it's not money, it's most of the time the, the entrepreneur's ability to understand what it takes to scale it up. Building organization, building repeat customer, building processes, hiring the leadership, etc., etc., play a huge role. And how you can be a uh, cost, whatever is your, is your kind of a sustainable model, if that is not properly placed, most of the time those factors play a heavy role in in uh, 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 kind of a building the scalable organization, either the for-profit and non-profit. Uh, I'm not taking is the, uh, the business model, but in a normal, I, I think is most of the time is not a capital, is the entrepreneurs or founders' ability, how they can think it is a long term, and how they decode the the kind of secret sauce in scaling the thing. Not that much money. Like I have been working in our Google set sandbox itself, with the more than 300 entrepreneurs who have set up in, in either health, education, etc. And they are very, very different degree of the scale. And, and capital is the one of the essential part of the, uh, the whole process, but it's not the part of it. Great. Thank you, Naveen. Uh, so we take the last question for the webinar. This question is from Lisa. Uh, the, and this question is for you, Naveen. Uh, the question is, if you're able to receive philanthropy funds uh, from either private or corporate foundations for social enterprise development, uh, what are your donors looking to fund specifically? Do they fund the youth skilling programs? And how do these typically form a part of their philanthropy portfolios? So if, if you ask me, the, the is a whole variety of landscape of the philanthropist. There's some corporate philanthropists, they have more uh, uh, very focused agendas uh, and uh, they want to focus on the sector. But at the same time, a lot of uh, individuals are there. They, they are, we, we are hearing they more believe in impact, impact not in these numbers, etc. but how we are empowering the community, how uh, those communities are, are taking part so different organizations have, uh, or individuals, either the high net worth individuals or corporate, they, they have a different kind of thought process. And more and more we are kind of uh, uh, seeing that people across the thing, whether in the education or health, they are looking for sustainable ideas. So even if they are uh, putting the charitable dollars or rupees uh, per se, but they are they are looking that okay this money can can be can be like typical in business you use the word sunk cost uh, you kind of uh, invest that much so you can make a viable business so even if it is a charity or, or philanthropy money but they would like to see some viable model can emerge and and later it can be sustainable or it can scale on different uh, thought processes so I would say that philanthropy has has matured a lot uh, some may have very specific like a skill or primary education or maths education or, or some like several times they have a backyard charity kind of also concept. For example, if companies are in Bangalore, they would like to take care of the Bangalore education or something. something. So, so those kind of thought process are there. But nowadays, philanthropy is getting uh, uh, far more kind of um, tuned to the sustainable ideas. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for this very interesting session. Thank you very much, Naveen and Deepak. We will post the webinar recording on our website by next week. Please look out for that.
Also, AVPN is holding the AVPN India Summit 2017, focused on investing for impact in education on 14 September in Mumbai, India. While the summit is officially sold out, please write to us in case you would like to be placed on the wait list. Good day, everyone. Thank you, Shima.